I'm Jeff Herzer and this is the observation deck and this is a special day to say the least because um, our guests are Eugene Cohn and Bill Pedersen from the very prestigious architecture firm of Cohn Pedersen Fox based in New York. Uh, when there are big projects around the world, uh, high profile projects that need doing and uh, the people who finance and build such things want uh, the best of the best to put their designs in. Uh, the phone rings at KPF, and it's such a treat to have you here. Thanks so much for, for visiting with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the Shanghai World Financial Center, uh, you were in Chicago last November to collect the award for uh, building of the year for the Shanghai World Financial Center, and it, uh, it certainly is a departure from other buildings that have been built in the world today. And for, uh, for the uninitiated, what's a general description of, of the Shanghai World Financial Center? Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a mixed-use building, and I think it's characteristic of multiple uses. Uh, makes it, uh, in fact, among tall buildings, an extremely civic structure, because the top 80 meters of the structure is devoted to spaces that everybody in the city can enjoy and use. Simply have to go into it and go up elevators and, and take advantage of it. So that is. It, the building does not really represent, I believe, a, sort of a captive of the private realm. It really represents the sense of the, the civic quality of the public realm. And uh, for us, that's an extremely important aspect. I, I was going to add that the, the form, uh, when you look uh, back at today, so many buildings are, are really sculptural. Their, their form is exaggerated, sloping, slanting, twisting, leaning. The beauty of this form is I think it really works with the function, which is office and hotel, retail at the base, but office space that reduces in size in terms of floor area, that relates to uh, users like the Japanese and Americans and the larger floors and European nations, the smaller floors of European companies, and then the hotel at the very top being the smallest floor by the part. So uh, its beauty and its shape also relate to its function and also to the wind, that great opening is to relieve the major wind force which is at the top of the building. So it's both structurally and functionally a form that's a, it's, it influences the form, which I think makes it exceptionally beautiful. If, if memory serves, this is really the first building in the world built after the Sears Tower that I don't think there are any arguments that isn't, it is indeed taller than the Sears Tower. Um, so it's kind of the modern day uh, answer to that era, at least, uh, at least so far. And uh, when you look at this building, uh, it really looks like the kind of thing that you might see on any modern skyline in the world. You know, you could plant this building anywhere and it would be at home. But uh, to hear you tell it, there really are design elements of this building that are very much Chinese. Well, I can uh, uh, explain a, a bit of that. Um, the um, intention on our part was to create a building is very specifically connected to this place, uh, not only China, but also to Pudong. Uh, to begin with, Pudong had been planned uh, by the urban planners to have 80 buildings, the lowest of which was uh, 40 stories in height. And most of those buildings have been completed now. And what I think is fair to say is that they create a visually cacophonous environment. We knew that we had the responsibility of designing what was to be at the time the tallest building in this entire complex of buildings. This site had been reserved for this particular purpose. And when confronted with that site, it became clear to us that we were never going to be able to um, work with the context by joining the cacophony. We would only work with the context by contrasting the cacophony site and so we wanted to create a building that was as serene as noble as we possibly could and at the time the oriental pearl tv tower was the highest structure in the world and it was on the tip of pudong and so our urbanistic relationship uh, the primary urbanistic relationship was to establish a pairing with the oriental pearl tv tower and the world financial center that was a, it's sort of a dialogue across space that was created but the, the um, impetus for designing this building uh, and the manner in which the form was arrived at comes, as Gene said, from the multiple uses of the building and the differentiation of a, 
the necessity of dimension in the office floor place to the dimension of the hotel floor place to the dimension of all of the observation platforms above. I was working at the time, and this seems a little bit far off field perhaps, but I have designed a door pole for a group called Forms and Surfaces. And I took a, a pure piece of geometry, a cylinder, and created the geometry of the final door pole as a result of the interaction of the human hand penetrating into the cylinder. And that created an extremely interesting piece of geometry. We did exactly the same thing here with much different visual results in, in, in Shanghai. What we did was we said that the building itself, because it's so tall, is really the connection between the earth and sky. That is the primary dramatization that we wanted to bring about. Now the Chinese, the ancient Chinese, had symbols that they utilized representing the earth and representing the sky. Um, they took these symbols and as physical artifacts and actually buried them with very prominent members of society. Uh, an example of the earth, an example of the sky. And they used a square prism to represent the earth. I made it out of dark stone, horizontal striations cut into it almost like a small high-rise building itself. The heavens were represented by a circular disk and of, of a light-colored jade. So we took these two geometric conditions and we fused them together. We took the square prism, which had a uniform floor plate all the way down it, and we actually carved it off by these great cylindrical arcs that we created, so these circular arcs that were almost cosmic circles. And that created the geometry of the building. So it's a sort of a fusion together of these two primary uh, symbols that, that are part of the ancient cultural uh, traditions of China. And, and, and coincided then with the functions within and the structure of design. Well, and that's such a wonderful description because you know the casual observer has kind of called it like a chisel with a hole in the top. Yours is so or much or, or, or about <laughs> look on her, but yours is so much lyrical. Uh, Number one, and uh, I don't think people realize what a cultural context that building indeed has. And uh, it's it's one of the unique buildings in the world in that it is also right next to another super tall, the Jin Mao building. And uh, from your description of it before, it was the, the serenity of your building. It's like it's trying to calm down this whole area. And what's what's the interaction like between your building and Jin Mao? I was going to say, from my observation, the energy of Jim Mao, the frenetic energy, is, is in great contrast to the simplicity and elegance of the quietness of ours. So the two really work extremely well together. They don't compete. In fact, they, they relate in the sense that they are different and they contrast. I think if ours had been as active in the skin as Jim Mao, well, the two would have fought each other and not been as successful. So I think we've been a very good neighbor to Jim and uh, Jim Mao tells to us. But I think it's uh, the two go together very extremely well by the contrast of the quiet elegance and the energy of the you know, exterior of you know, Jim Mao. And of course, you, you're you in a unique position in that you're going to have a 2,000 foot tall building as a next door neighbor uh, probably within the next decade. Uh, are you a little concerned about that? Well, that's an interesting question. We actually uh, worked on the design of that 2,000 foot high building. and. Uh, based on uh, our philosophical belief that every new addition to the context ought to in fact have a fairer relationship or a connection to these immediate existing contexts. Uh, the the uh, creating a building that developed a relationship with the World Financial Center was primary on my mind. Uh, and I had a very specific point of view about how that was <laughs> done. Uh, I'm not necessarily uh, are convinced that that has been accomplished, but nevertheless, I, I thought it was one of the potential you know, possibilities. But getting back to your initial question about the relationship of the Jim Mao building to the World Financial Center, uh, here in Chicago, we did 333 Wacker Drive in 1983, and the, that context of 333 Wacker Drive on the river was based on a relationship between almost an entirely masonry uh, uh, um, river context. When you, when you think of the world, uh, the trademark directly across the way, this great stone monolith. 
And so what we tried to do was create a connection to the context through opposition as opposed to through some way of, of, of trying to imitate the context. And that's exactly what we did here in the, in the case of the, the Jim Mao building. Adrian Smith had a very specific point of view about creating the, the, uh, the Jim Mao building and its relationship to Chinese uh, qualities, and he did it very well. Uh, he took essentially almost the pagoda form, and, and, and then because of its additive elements, then created a vertical a building out of it, and, and, and gave it a, a highly textured surface, which is beautifully detailed and refined. Our surfaces then become extremely uh, planar in relationship to that, and the, the juxtaposition between the simplicity of our service and the textural quality of Adrian's building, I think, created a, a, a very interesting bond between the two. And, and frankly, uh, our building looks better because of, of, of the uh, Jim Ma building, and I think and the Jim Ma looks better than as a result of our building. I find one of the questions interesting because it's rare that people do tall buildings really worry about context. It's more to be their own icon. And so they're more about competing. And the fact that we tried very much to relate to Jim Mao, as Bill described, is I think one of the few times that you see where the tall building, as an icon, is really working with another icon to create a better, better condition of the skyline. And most every other tall building is out to overcome and compete with its neighbor or the tall buildings on the skyline. So I think that's the rare one. That these two really do work beautifully together along with the TV tower. Well, and consider consider what that environment would be like without one of those, because it would certainly change, I think, the character of all the buildings, and you would you would think of them in an entirely different way. And that's and that's quite a statement with creations of that size that are supposed to be iconic, and working well together. It's like losing one of the Marx Brothers if one of them's not there. <laughs> without, without, without Zeppo, right? <laughs> well, the architectural historian Colin Rowe, um, a very important man in our field used to talk about urban stabilizers. <clears throat> and the role of this particular building, given the cacophony of the visual environment, was to create an urban stabilizer, a visual stabilizer for the entire environment around. So it rallied, was rallied by a very simple object that, that created sort of a focus for the entire context. Mm -hmm. And that, that's true if you stand on the true seaside and look at the, at the food out this elevation. I mean, it is a very noisy group of buildings. And Shanghai Royal Financial Center gives it that anchor and that calmness that I think holds the entire skyline together in a very beautiful way because every one of the buildings leading up to it is quite different in color, shape, form, and then all of a sudden you get this elegant building rising above the rest and I think holding them all together and Bill's point section. Well, and that's an excellent point too because when you look at pictures of Shanghai, it looks like they went through uh, the skyscraper catalog and kick one of these and one of these. I mean, it is a truly a stunning collection of buildings that uh, I don't know if some architecture critics are of the opinion that perhaps they don't belong together, but it is certainly uh, an eclectic collection, if nothing else. And you have to have a KPF, and uh, you have to have uh, this particular piece of art, you know, a building done by you to make the collection complete. Uh, what's your observation about this collection of buildings in Shanghai? and? Uh, and yours does truly pull all of that together? I believe so, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you eliminated it from the skyline and looked at the skyline again and then put it back, you can do that photographically, you see the impact it has made on the skyline. I mean, one of the great things about Bill's work right from the start was his concern that the tower fit the con in the context, to be part of it, in contrast with it, but somehow it relates. And I think this building does it more beautifully than almost any other building we've done. You have, you have created truly one of the unique public places in the world today in the observation deck of the Shanghai World Financial Center. It's this, at least from the pictures I've seen, it's this kind of pentagonal mm -hmm. shape that uh, kind of hangs from the upper edge of the aperture of that building. You, know, you have uh, the view of the city on both sides and then through the floor below. What an incredible incredible space. Uh, how do you feel that turned out, and did it turn out as well in reality as what your imagination thought it would be? <laughs> that has quite a history. Um, we needed an aperture on the top of the building to be able to allow wind to pass through it. Great height of the building creates essentially a cantilevered beam in space, and the 
wind forces to push this structure over are frankly greater than the gravitational forces necessary just to simply support the structure. So the, uh, ap the inclusion of an aperture was necessary. We thought that here we are in China again, we want to reinforce this context, a, a cultural context, why not put in a Chinese moon gate? And you see them all over wonderful gardens in China. So we put a circular aperture through the building. I first presented this building in Pudong to 14 professors of architecture. And I gave a 10 minute presentation. Each of them had a half hour to respond to my 10 minute presentation. The first professor got up and started it all off by saying, well, perhaps this building is desirable, but it's or acceptable, but it certainly isn't desirable. And we just couldn't figure it out because everybody loved the building, looking at, looking at least everybody we showed it to. We found out a month later in a Hong Kong newspaper that said the Japanese developer, our client is Japanese, marches into Shanghai with a flag held high. They'd taken the Chinese moon gate and inverted it into the Japanese flag in their own mind. The rising sun. The rising sun. And so this caused a, a great deal of consternation on everybody's part for a long period of time. And the deputy mayor of Shanghai came to visit Mr. Mori in Tokyo. And at that meeting, I suggested putting a bridge across the, the circular aperture. And the, the, the mayor of uh, Shanghai thought it was a great idea because it symbolized the joining together between two sides. And it also defused the symbolism of the circle. Well, that lasted for about eight or 10 years. And then finally, you know, this project has gone on for 15, 16 years. Finally, uh, the issue became clearer. They did not want to have any, any semblance of representation of the circle. So we changed the form of the interface to the trapezoid that we have now. And that brought about then this great sky bridge that we didn't have in the original design. And but it is successful. And, and people line up around the building just to get to that observation deck. Views are marvelous, unless you're afraid of heights, because there's glass floors and glass on the sides. But we had some receptions up there, and they're pretty spectacular. It is certainly a unique place, yeah. and I, I really can't think of any other place in the world that's, yeah. that's quite like that one, in that you have this narrow strip with light coming in from both sides. Um, you know, and also, the, the reason for it, I think it, it's important to mention that Mr. Mori, our client, um, has a great belief in, in tall buildings being more than just a, a single mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Mori uh, uh, has a belief in the urbanistic characteristics of tall buildings, which is, is a fundamental philosophy on his part to try to get people to come back into the city, uh, particularly in Tokyo, where people commute two hours from the place of living to the place of work. He believes that it's, it, it's really exhausting a tremendous amount of energy uh, that potentially could be put to a more productive use. And so his fundamental philosophy is to create cities within <coughs> cities. And each tall building is thought of as a city in itself, within a city. And that, that's why he's so committed to the concept of dedicating a large portion of the building to the civic use by everybody. So he transferred this idea to the Shanghai building. Uh, and the upper, it's not just the observation platform that's, that's dedicated to public use. There are a whole series of floors underneath the aperture which are dedicated to public use. You have a deck in the aperture that you can come out on as well. So it, it is really, uh, again, as I mentioned, a, a, it is a, a city within a city that he's, he's, he's tried to construct here in this building. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, it's, it's very easy for someone like me to look at the uh, Shanghai World Financial Center and it's, it's tall and it's, well, I won't say thin, but it's, it's kind of traditionally like some of the other buildings that have gone up. And you hear accounts today of how buildings are being designed with public spaces and some with winter gardens and more than just an office building. And and the Shanghai World Financial Center sounds indeed like more of that new model than perhaps meets the eye. Well, the, the serenity of the visual form of the, of the building somewhat belies the fact that within it uh, is this uh, very diverse assemblage of pieces. And the, the clue to that 
uh, is at the base of the building. Uh, we had decided that we wanted to create a tremendous heaviness at the base of the building, so to emphasize this quality of moving from the earth to the sky. And so the top to the bottom, uh, about 80 feet of the building, is all clad in stone. But fused onto this stone base are a series of entrances to the diverse programmatic functions of the building. So as you walk around the building, you, you see this structure almost like a, a, an obelisk standing within a village. And this quality, the scale that this lower village gives to the, the connection between the human being and the, the structure itself is quite unique. But it totally, uh, it, totally uh, it creates a, a, a sense that this is not an office building, it's not a hotel only, it's all of these things, and it feels all of the diversity of the parts is represented out of the base rather than being represented in the tower itself. I think that is a key point, because look at this elegant form that is tapering as it goes up, and the skin is the same for all of the uses, you see, you're not aware of the different uses, but within it are these wonderful changes of use and public space, at the very top. I, I think that very few developers that I know would devote so much of a top of a building to public space when you can get the highest rents. Mr. Moore does that consistently with his buildings. And he's very much concerned with the public being involved. And with many, and, and as Bill said before, the city within the city. And that's one of the big differences. Most towers you see are really single-use towers, office or residential, maybe hotel residential. Although, uh, I mean, Chicago was probably one of the first cities to explore in its tall buildings, uh, mixed use. Uh, quite a few years, going back to the handcar, I think, in the late 60s. A similar in a way, its expression of the outside belies a little bit what's taking place within. But I think this building uh, in Shanghai really summarizes what Mr. Mori and what we all believe in terms of a tall building and its being mixed use and open to the public and private. You know, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever heard the term public involvement used in the context of a tall building. Getting getting input, presumably, if, if this is the context in which you're using it, in that uh, you're getting community feedback on what's going to go there. What was that component like for this building? Community feedback in terms of the, the dialogue between uh, the, the public sector and, 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 and our developer, Mr. Moore. Uh, there was a great deal of, of uh, dialogue. Uh, with the planning officials of Pudong. Uh, but there were not, there were no community meetings that were held as it would be characteristic in Germany or the United States or whatever, where citizens could get up and start to you know, rally against or war or something. <laughs> there, we, we had none of that. Uh, that was all uh, was taken care of behind the scenes, I guess, but we did, we did not have any direct involvement. We did have, of course, as I mentioned before, the involvement of the 14 professors of architecture each of whom had a, a position on, on the building itself. That must have been fun, too, then. Yeah. Well, that day was one of the most difficult days of my life. Right. To be <laughs> <laughs> First of all, because uh, uh, language, uh, the, the English language was uh, ranked third in the list of translations. <laughs> and so by the time the translation got around to me, the effect had uh, long past. Well, and you get 10 minutes to speak, and then they each get 30 minutes to work you over, basically. Uh, they worked me over, and they they had seven uh, workovers uh, in, before lunch. And then at lunch, uh, the, the Chinese never serve uh, anything that moves. Uh, nothing, uh, uh, but the, the Japanese frequently do, and, and this, in a sense, was a, a lunch in honor uh, of the Japanese, and so we had something that actually moved on the plate. And I was to skewer it with my chopsticks, and uh, I, couldn't help but feel that this is a real metaphor for my experience that day. That I, I was being, in fact, skewered by the chops. You, you could sympathize with the fish. Right? You could sympathize with the fish, yes. Yeah. Um, I, again, I just want to reinforce one thing that, that, that Bill said, because the community really wasn't involved. In it, this goes back again to Mr. Mori and his philosophy and belief in buildings and the use of the building. And the public plays a very big role in that. So he's unlike most developers that he cares about that and devotes some of the most expensive space in the building to the least rewarding financially. But at the same time, the most rewarding for the building's success in the community. Mr. Moore made a very interesting comment when he was presenting the Rapungi Hills building in New York. The Museum of Modern Art was playing a role in the, in the, the 
the museum space on the top of the building. He had a relationship with it. And he said to them, he said, this, uh, this museum occupies 5% of the real estate of the entire project, but it occupies 25% of my heart, which I, I thought was, is pretty much his point of view. The, the Shanghai World Financial Center, uh, I, I remember the first time I saw a drawing of it was probably 1997. And uh, this project has really been kind of a moving target for you and then it began construction and then it stopped and then the client said, we want it taller. Uh, have you ever worked a project like that before? Is this the new normal in, uh, in architectural design? You're talking about the change in height or the yes, that delay or both? All of the above. Well, the delay was unusually long. Uh, I, I, uh, and it, it had to do more with the, the market in, in the late 90s being oversaturated or at least too, many vac too much vacant space. And Mr. Marty decided it wasn't a good time to build, and so he stopped construction. Uh, I don't know what it's both the city and, uh, and Mr. Marty decided to make the building larger. Well, but you couldn't change the foundations, they were already built. So the building, building rests on uh, piles which are grown uh, 90 meters down into this uh, soupy soil that they have. A thousand feet of mud. And uh, so uh, the challenge of taking a building from 460 meters to 492 meters, Mr. Moore wanted to build it 500 meters, but the city didn't want to get to the 500 meter topic mark. So uh, they had wanted it larger or taller, but not as tall as Mr. Moore. And uh, so then, as a result, the, the floor plates needed to get larger as well. To make a long story short, we're putting a much heavier building on a foundation that was designed for a lighter building. Well, how much how much of the drawings and the design had been done when they said, okay, we want it taller? I mean, it wasn't simply a matter of adding more floors. The, the, the building had been completely structured. It was ready for construction. It was in construction. All the piles had been placed. And the construction was going to proceed, and then it was stopped in, I believe, 1997. And so the Leslie Robertson came in at that point and took over the new assignment as instructional engineer. He came in uh, and his wife, Satine C. And they took a building that was of one weight at 460 uh, meters in height and essentially created the same weight but a much larger building wow. <laughs> with a lighter structure. They did that. The columns don't touch the foundations. Doctor. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So the weight doesn't count. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I'm going to take a breather. What else do you want to talk about as far as Shanghai World Financial Center? Are we pretty much there? Well, I think the interesting thing uh, would be aspects of its uh, uh, safety, security, and the manner in which the building is structured, because I think everybody that we talk to is always interested in that as a result of 9 11. You know, and uh, how, how is that dealt with in, in the, with the Chinese code and, and with uh, this specific structure? Because their code is much stricter than ours. Really? What, what is that like? I can say, well, one, uh, the, the core in this case is uh, at some points four feet concrete and reinforcing, and reinforcing, steel reinforcing, which encloses the elevator stairs and so forth, which compared to the, not, you know, the World Trade Center in New York, which had steel frame and sheetrock, would be much better regard against any of the major problems that was caused by 9-11. Uh, but more important than that, they have uh, refuge floors, which are not used for any other function than gathering during an emergency, which are fireproof, have their own uh, air conditioning, tele, you know, telephone communications, etc., cetera. Uh, and they occur about every 13 floors in the building. Um, it's hard to imagine a U.S. developer giving up usable space at that ratio. And, uh, but it allows for people to be pre-assigned in case of any emergency to a given rest refuge floor. And then they're evacuated in a very orderly way uh, in what is, I think, a very safe core for the stairs and elevators. They also have fireman's lift, which is true around most of the world, but not in America. Uh, more action stairs than we have. So and from a safety point of view, they have a lot more elements that make it a very safe building, in not just anticipation of 9-11 type of problem, but enormous winds, earthquake possibilities, things of that sort, fire that you could have emergencies. People can evacuate that building in a very orderly and safe way. 
that's important. Well, and I, I guess the structural system of the building is drastically different than the World Trade Center. Right. Well, yes. Same structural engineer. But, uh, right. But many years later. But many years later, and the, the refuge floors, in our case, they're every 13 floors. By Chinese code, they're required every 15 floors. So we exceed the, essentially exceed the code uh, with it. But the refuge floors provide an ideal opportunity to create great trusses that span from the core to the outside structural disclosure. Uh, and it gives you a full depth without interrupting a usable office floor. But the, and so that has basically created the it's structural true. efficiency of the building, utilizing that full floor depth every 13 floors to create what they call outrigger trusses that go out to the perimeter of the You're building. Great so that gave, gave an extremely efficient bracing system. But there are other aspects. Uh, first of all, um, the, there, as Gene just referred to, the fireman's lifts. There are three fireman's lifts within the building. There are two elevators which are utilized to go to the up to the observation floors that can be used in case of emergency to go down gotcha. to each one of these refuge floors. And so we have five elevators that are they're totally dedicated to the possibility of evacuating people, let alone the elevators for the basic service of the building. Well, the difference between a, a regular passenger elevator and a fireman's lift is what? Size. Size, size it's weight carrying capacity. And it, you, you can make people in stretchers down. You can put 50, 60 people in the one. And, the, and it, they, they rise within a minute to the very time. You know, this elevator takes you to the, to the top of the floor that we were discussing, the observation deck. 66 seconds, one run. You don't even move, feel the elevator moving. So I was going to say, is that significantly faster than elevators in other buildings, other tall buildings? I believe it is, because 66 seconds to climb over 1,600 feet is a pretty amazing speed. Well, and, and without any movement, you do not feel any shutter. The only thing is, your ears might pop. Well, I, I remember that um, reading about elevators in Japan, for example, that the Japanese have a very much uh, different personal tolerance for being uh, speeded up and slowed down, you know, accelerated and decelerated than Americans do. Uh, and it's kind of amazing to hear that you really don't feel anything in those other things. I didn't do it. I've been there several times. So. Did you, Bill? No, I didn't, I didn't do it, but the, the, this, the audience here is. Uh, it's a very diverse audience. You know, people from all over the world are going to experience these elevators. And so the, uh, the the lesser tolerance of those Americans that may ride uh, it needs to be accommodated as well. The, the Japanese contractors came over and installed those rails, so they're absolutely perfect. So they really do. It's a quite an amazing ride. The the difference you you have dealt with the Chinese, you have dealt with Donald Trump, uh, you have dealt with the city of Chicago. I mean, there's there's a spectrum of uh, of clients and personalities. Dealing with the Chinese, uh, any big difference than dealing with anyone else any, anyone else in the world? Good question. Uh, it's hard to generalize because not all the clients are the same, but we've had great, we're, we're professional with a lot of offshore Chinese clients in China, from Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, elsewhere. Um, and, the, and the Chinese clients we work with who are, say, in Beijing, who are native, uh, have all been, I would say in general, excellent clients who really want to do quality buildings, who care about the building, care about the users, and we enjoy, I, mean, I think we've enjoyed working with just about every one of them. Uh, so in general, Chinese clients would rank very high in my book, uh, as, long as, as well as Japanese clients, uh, who also demand quality. It's interesting, they don't share with you the budget. You know, in America, you start out, the budget's a very big thing. To my, my experience, it's been they don't discuss it. If they feel the building is too expensive, they'll ask you to make some changes. But you're not working against a, you know, like $200 a square foot or some such number. And it gives you a chance to explore and to show them exciting schemes and, and solutions that might, you might not show if the budget had been very prominent in your mind. And I think that leads to some really very excellent buildings. Given that the Chinese economic system is, of course, radically different than America's and Western capitalism, um, you would think that maybe the rules were different there in terms of uh, doing business and what you had to deal with in terms of budget and money they had to spend. Now, I've talked to people about Dubai, which, of course, is the energy center of the world, which is where all of our dollars seem to be going. Mm -hmm. And they have their sensibilities, too, and it's not a carte blanche situation where you can do whatever you want. Uh, 
the Chinese situation, uh, even though the economic rules are different over there, uh, the basic rules in terms of being on budget and uh, the constraints that you have on you are the same as anywhere else? Well, this, uh, Mr. Roy uh, is Japanese and was our client for the World Financial Center. Mr. Roy is, has a, a very deep philosophy about he, what he wants as a building to accomplish in the city, as we've already discussed. But Mr. Roy is also a wonderful businessman, and he uh, wants his buildings to be extremely efficient, extremely economical. And this building, um, and one of the aspects of the building that I think is extremely important is what one might refer to as embodied energy. In other words, the energy that it takes to, to actually manufacture the components of the building itself. And we believe that this is where our building is extraordinarily efficient from a sustainable point of view because it's highly efficient in terms of the amount of surface area we have per enclosed square foot. The actual surface itself is in many respects, quite similar to 333 Wacker Drive, which is our most efficient exterior wall. Uh, a, a beautiful wall, but not an expensive wall. And the same is true with the Shanghai building as well. Everything in the Shanghai building is evaluated very rigorously by them for cost. And so that was the primary challenge, but it was also something that was in the building's form enabled us to do an economical building and still create a, a beautiful structure. Yeah. Just so I clarify what I said, that's not that they're not concerned about cost. They don't start out by putting your budget down. They look at this, you explore ideas, and then as you're working with them, uh, they're very content. They will help to manage the process to keep the building on the budget they obviously have in mind. But they don't make, it's not about you've got to meet this budget or else. They will be very open about design ideas. And, but they care about their quality, they care about it being efficient, and they're good developers. They're solid, and builds right. Mr. Murray, most of them are very good business people. And so they do care about the end product being one that they can make. Well, in, in business, business is business anywhere in the world, yeah. and, and you still have to hit your marks whether you're dealing with yeah. you know, Donald Trump or uh, Dubai or China. That's correct. Right. <laughs> um, let me take a breath here. Uh, two of your other big projects in the world today, um, the International Commerce Center in Hong Kong, uh, beautiful building. Uh, tell me a little of the history of that one. That was a competition. We competed against four architects. Three others. Three other architects, yes. And uh, it was quite clear that the developer wanted to build a very efficient building. So we started with that premise. And we worked with Leslie Robertson at the very beginning and it was in the design. And we looked at a whole series of types, shape types, that, that how could we create the greatest, greatest efficiency for that building? And so um, the building is a product of, of initially, again, as the building in Shanghai was, of doing an extremely efficient building, but at the same time, we then created uh, an amplification of, of the form of that building through the texture of its surface, uh, through the manner in which it sort of flows out of the ground, because I looked at I looked at Hong Kong and you look at, you look across at the, at the center of Hong Kong and you see buildings almost starting to represent plant material. They grow out with such enthusiasm here, you know, up against the mountains, and, and the buildings look like they're these biological entities. You know. So I uh, thought that it would be wonderful if you could give a sense that the building is actually growing from the earth. And in taking this very simple square floor plan, we created a series of, sort of uh, sheets on, on the exterior of the building, each of which was independent on each side. And it, it came down and flowed into the ground. So the building has a very sort of uh, or, organic quality to, to it. There was an interesting thing about cost, though, and efficiency. Uh, the owner started out saying the bill's correct, that they made a very efficient and economic building. And one of the key issues is where to place the hotel, because it affected the structure. If you placed a hotel at the very top, you had to stiffen that building a lot more because it was very uncomfortable to be in a hotel during a, a hurricane or tornado. That's something that's rarely brought up in that these buildings do move. Exactly. And you have water sloshing around in sinks and mm -hmm. right, et cetera. So a hotel at that height uh, was a bigger problem than an office, because office you can evacuate your home. Your guests, you're really stuck there. 
So we studied the hotel lower down in the building and thinking that was the right thing to do from an economic point of view. But it's interesting, the owner was so concerned about that view from the hotel. Remember, the peak in Hong Kong was 400 meters. This building was over 480. So that top part of the building he wanted for the hotel the spectacular views that you wouldn't get only below that. And so even though it cost more, because the structure was definitely costly to keep that building from moving too much, we put the hotel at the top. We had to make that change later in the design competition because early on we had it below. Thinking we were very, very smart putting the hotel low and saving lots of money. So the owner did in that case increase the budget to achieve what he wanted to. Well, here again, you have another iconic landmark building that is having a dialogue with another building, and in this case, that's uh, Caesar College Two International yeah, Finance sure. Center. And what uh, what was your thought process? Uh, well, they forgot goalposts, but they do form the gateway <laughs> to the harbor. And, well, it's uh, quite striking because yeah. you have you have Kelly's building, which is in the middle of some action, and uh, there's not nearly as much going on on your side of. Uh, yeah. Although it's, it's improving because they're more residential and retail. Um, but they do absolutely work together. Well, you still have the dialogue, but over a longer distance. What, did, did as much thought go into your building there as it did into being next door to the Jim Mao building? Yes. The, the same attitude uh, took place. We knew that we were going to be relating to Caesar's building. These two buildings would be the, in a sense, the gateway to the Inner Harbor. Uh, and would be perceived as such as one came into the Inner Harbor. So the relationship between the two buildings was, uh, was carefully studied. Uh, as, as a point of departure. Um, but it's the same owner, by the way. Oh, of course. And, and when we say that they're far away, they're how far from one building to the other? Quite a distance. Sorry. I would say approximately a mile. But the, 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 interesting, one pass. the interesting thing about um, the Kowloon development, you know, Kowloon's, the Kowloon station is the first stop uh, from the airport takes 18 minutes to get from the airport to the Kowloon station. And what is interesting now about development, particularly in Asia, it's all occurring over transportation nodes, as it should. And that, that is really pointing, I think, a, a finger towards the future of development. Well, and what we're not doing in the United States. Exactly, exactly. And, and that is uh, why I think, uh, and right now you say that Kowloon doesn't have as much activity as Central does, or Caesar's building is, but Kowloon will very quickly become extremely dense because it is all built around this, uh, with that transportation houses and spaces. And then one other interesting thing, by the way, is that that building has been leased and used by Morgan Stanley, as an example, before it's finished. They've actually broken it into two or three unit sections. So the first part of the building is, under, is in use for the rest is being built. It's very rare you see that in this country. And that's how far from completion? Oh, it's about two years. As we begin 2009, still two years away. Probably well in the 2000, end of 2010, I think it's due But we, it's been a catalyst, by the way, to Calhoun. One thing to answer your question is that, like the Wall Street Journal ran an article saying that town was the catalyst for great growth in Calhoun, attracting major companies like Morgan Stanley, CS First Boston, uh, to there. So uh, I think Bill's actually right. It's going to, you're going to see a great more appeal of activity there as a result of that town. We seem to be seizing on a theme here in that uh, we've discussed two of your um, really uh, iconic projects, the Shanghai World Financial Center and uh, International Commerce Center that have some sort of interaction with another tall building, uh, whether it's next door or across the bay. Um, the big news, I guess, for your firm these days is the American Commerce Center in Philadelphia, uh, which was officially approved back in November of 2008. Uh, 1,200 feet tall to the roof and what, 1,500 feet to the top of the spire, spire, roughly, and uh, on the order of 85 floors. And uh, the significance of this building is that um, taller than the Sears Tower, officially, uh, one of the tallest buildings in North America, depending on which building gets built next. Uh, and it's right next door to another iconic Philadelphia building, a Comcast building. It's true. It, interesting enough, yeah, Philadelphia. You should probably have it in one of your charts because in Philadelphia it had the tallest building in the world in 1901, which was City Hall. And um, it's still the tallest, largest masonry bearing building in the world. So I use that as part of our justification that, because that, uh, a lot of Philadelphians are very conservative and the thought of a super tall building was of less interest to them 
you might be elsewhere. Um, but I pointed out that they were very bold in 1901 when they had this great structure finished and it became the catalyst to much of Philadelphia's development. And then in 86, when the height limits were lifted from the feet of William Penn, the top of City Hall, uh, to other, a greater height, it's led to all these super tall buildings, many tall buildings, very tall buildings, not super tall. But the American Commerce Center will be a super tall building and will become the new, I think, image of Philadelphia, although it works quite well with Comcast. So the two, much like we discussed in Shanghai, play a role one with the other. And I think they're very effective together. Well, but this is not, this partnership has not gone off without some controversy, right? Well, no, I mean, uh, obviously the, the neighbors to this building are not as excited about such a super tall big building being their, their neighbor. And having their views <coughs> obstructed. Some of their views are. Some are actually views. very <laughs> sensitive to have great windows between the hotel, I mean, space, which you call the window. That's a fact of life. Hotel in, and an office building. That's a fact of life in, in cities, cities right? with high yeah. density, uh, high density yeah. tall buildings. Yeah, if you live on the block, somebody's going to build across the streets, you really can't stop it. But this, will, I'll tell you what's important about this project, because it's a hotel, has major retail, including marvelous food market for the neighbors. It brings safety and life at the street all around. Uh, it's right now a parking lot. It has a marvelous hotel. It has a series of public space up throughout the building, uh, at the ground level, third level, and sixth level. Museum quality space in terms of the exhibit at the levels off these great open space. The open space is 19,000 square feet at the sixth level. Pretty amazing. Gardens that look out over the city. And then even higher, at the, the, the uh, 490 foot, there's an outdoor terrace, gardens. So that the community can enjoy not only the shopping, the movies, and health club and hotel facilities, but public space that's stag that is staggered and vertically through this building like with easy access. So it becomes a great public amenity, not just in the office. And coming soon to a city near you, do we know uh, the construction timetable yet? Well, obviously we're in a very difficult financial time. Um, there is one or two, there are one or two major tenants that are serious about the building. And should the one or two of them sign, this building will proceed probably earliest construction will start will be 2010, 2011, depending on the Tenants, uh, you are the guys who, who have to go out and sell these buildings. And part of what you do is, uh, and part of why you're so successful is that you have to, uh, you have to come up with the concept, package it, sell it to the client, and uh, I mean that's, that's it essentially, but you are specialists in going out there and ascertaining the client's needs and coming up with something um, culturally sensitive, uh, sensitive to its surroundings, and uh, Describe that for me. I mean, that's that is one of the best things that you do. I mean, nobody does it better. What's the secret? Is there one? <laughs> the secret is intention. 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 I think that's that. That, that because if, if one begins with the desire to do it, then that becomes the entire focus of the design exploration. And you know, the programmatic components that go into the building obviously are based on the desire on, on the part of our clients to include them or not include them, we'll make suggestions, but nevertheless, uh, they're pretty much running the show. But the manner in which the building tries to find a, a connection with its place and its context, and the manner in which the building becomes a representation of the civic realm, that is, that is our responsibility. And that's what, that's what we define as our role, and that's our primary role. Has the business changed since the era of the Sears Tower and that uh, you would build an iconic building and uh, not pay as much attention or concern to what was going on in the rest of town while I built my building and yeah. I've done what I'm no, supposed I to do. I think both the architects as well as the owners have taken a greater interest in the role and responsibility of these buildings as they, they are built in the cities. One thing I should point out that the American Commerce Center is also tied to transportation. We're, we're building a connection underground to the main concourse of the suburban station which ties into three subways, regional trains that then tie into the north-south metro line between New York and Washington. So this population is sitting over the best transportation in the city of Philadelphia. And therefore, and we add a retail below grade into the concourses. So the building will be a vital part of the city and bring to the citizens 
from great shopping to all these wonderful entertainment activities to improve the quality of life in Philadelphia. And if you knew the area where it's being built, frankly, there was no nightlife, there was little day life there. This will really change the city dramatically and contribute to it in an amazing way. I'd I like to specifically respond to your question because I think it is a very good one. And in a way, our firm um, set about to uh, achieve this uh, with the tall building, uh, as improbable as it seemed in the 1970s, 1980s when we began. We started, uh, very unlike smaller firms, we started with large projects. And, and Gene had, had been president of John Carl Warnicke's office. Uh, we were together there in that office. We, we were able to work with developers right from the beginning. And, and most of our practice was focused on the office building. Well, the office building at that time had very little concern, frankly, for issues of the civic nature. The office building was thought of by a lot of critics as being somewhat of a financial instrument of exploitation, is what it amounted to. And we set upon ourselves to try to develop strategies to find ways of creating the ability for the tall building to connect to its context, to be able to somehow act as a catalyst for the context. And we've gone through a lot of different strategies. Some panned out, some didn't pan out. We went through a whole classical period that we utilized at 900 North Michigan as an example of it. And uh, we ultimately rejected classical strategies because they, buildings could not be built with the same sort of resonance or fidelity that the original buildings were. And so, uh, but we, our intention has always been the same. How do we find ways to make the all going to contribute to a larger context rather than itself. Thanks, we've done that corporate necessarily. It was all about designing by statistics. Area, cost per square foot, rent per square foot, return on investment. Bankers never even looked at designs, they looked at the performance. It was strictly the numbers. Strictly the numbers. And a lot of very bad buildings got built. And it was really, what, I, what we found, the Tom, I mean, we were very fortunate to have Tom Cossack as one of our first clients. He was one of the first people who cared about a building's design, maybe because he was from Chicago. Uh, and the quality of that design, its impact in the city, that allowed us to do a terrific project. And he wanted to see it built, even though the market wasn't great when he built it. And in a way, that got us started, because we, as Bill said, really believed in the tall building. And, and right from the start, the, the tall, uh, here's what we, we, we had a discussion when we started the firm. We want to do houses, museums, clearly say we want to do anything, we had the person be, be selected. But we decided that the, where America needed most attention was in the cities and with commercial buildings. Because they weren't being done by very good architects, right, for the most part. And the city influences most of our lives, we should really care about it. And so we chose that as the direction. We would go back in 1976, and it was really Don Klusnik who gave us the chance to show that we could really do something special with the tall building make it a real contribution to the city. So. And without without going into a grand analysis of 333 South Wacker, which so many people have done, let's reduce it down to what, uh, how, how is this building your firm's statement about, uh, about the skyscraper and its interaction with the city? Well, it was a statement made in 1980 and built and finished in 1983, and we've been working 25 years. And but this is the one that put you on the map. It, it put us on the map, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it was in regard to our intellectual exploration of <clears throat> the tall building, the beginning of our process is what it amounted to. The building specifically responded to the band of the river. The Chicago River at that point, uh, as you know, takes a, a sharp turn, and we wanted this building to be able to mark on the skyline that particular event within this, the, the fabric of the city. Right? And so that, that curved belly of the building was an immediate, intuitive response. First seeing the site, it, was, it, it, it just seemed like a, a perfect opportunity to reinforce it with that gesture. And so when we presented Tom Klutznik the initial models, that was what captivated him. Uh, and everything from that point on was sort of the development of it. But the, the building so clearly connects to its place. The building has been so well received by so many people, even cab drivers uh, love, love that building, that in, in many respects, uh, 
despite all of the intellectualizing about the tall building, it may be our most successful example, but I think now the World Financial Center probably has taken it to, uh, another step. But I, I was really commending Kevin in here on Fussman, that as a developer, he chose this not for the financial reasons, as we stated in the beginning, because of the design. And, and I just thought that was quite special. And, um, and he was right. The building has turned out to be a great success and has accomplished all we set out to do. Going from there, and I, I've asked this of a number of people, and it's, it's interesting to hear the takes of, of every individual I ask this, of every individual I ask this of, is that I don't know that any architect necessarily sets out to design the world's tallest building, design super talls, and it's just kind of a case of being in the right place at the right time and waking up one morning and all of a sudden you're putting in a proposal on fill in the blank. Uh, is that the way you feel? Our super t and our super tall buildings, do you want to continue doing them, or is it, are there other things you want to do? The answer is both. <laughs> there are other things we want to do, but we do, uh, are always excited about the super tall building. We're actually doing one taller now in China. And that is which one? It's called the Ben Yang building. It's an insurance company. And it will be um, 600 plus meters. So not as tall as some of the others being proposed, but it's certainly a super tall building. But height is never an objective in itself. Dominance is never an objective. And frankly, beauty is never an objective. One never sets out to design a beautiful building. Because if you do, yeah, you're, you're always going to fail. Um, one only sets out to solve a problem, to find ways of dealing with a building in a particular place. And if, if it all comes together and it ultimately results in a beautiful building, I mean, that's the idea. We want, we want to create build, beautiful buildings, but we don't say, we want to build the tallest, we don't say we want to build the most beautiful. Uh, you're, you're really trying to solve a problem when you're, when you're dealing with any design situation. So every building is indeed a, a very individual response to a certain site. One, one final question that I just have to ask you is that uh, one of your more recent projects, uh, very successful and I think actually on budget was uh, a doghouse, was a doghouse. Success, what, is, success. what is that? What is that? Yeah. Successful, but not on budget. Over budget. Yeah, well over budget, and it was our budget that was succeeded. Uh, we were asked by the Animal Medical Center if we would do a structure for either a bird or a cat or a dog, and since the, I have a dog, and uh, the young man who helped me in the office had a dog as well, we decided to do a doghouse. But we want, didn't want to just do a doghouse to do a doghouse. We wanted to make this the most advanced thinking we could possibly make. Uh, uh, on the whole subject of a, a geometry and whatever. Uh, and so we used a marvelous uh, construction technique called com computer numeral t uh, control systems, CNC sy uh, systems, to create a uh, structure that has an absolutely spectacular geometry. Uh, and it's all based on the movement of the dog that actually starts to spin around before the dog goes to, to rest. What kind of dog is the question that that's to be asked? Well, Mid-sized dog. Mid-sized dog. Mid -sized Mid -sized dog. Yes. Specification. I have two large <laughs> dogs. That, uh, yeah. It didn't yeah. qualify. Yeah. This, uh, this is for a boxer, a 50-pound boxer, or you know, up to the 80-pound. Or a wrestler. <laughs> you know you have the world eating out of your hand when every, every little project all of a sudden gets international attention. And, and this is this is the kind of project that you would only hear about on the observation deck. That's exactly right, and we never uh, we don't get any uh, real attention for t the big buildings, but this one has achieved yeah, more attention than anything we've ever done in the past. So thank you both for coming by. This is like having Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and uh, Derek Jeter and uh, A. Rod all in the same room. So thank you so much for talking to us. It's been thoroughly enjoyable, and I hope we see each other again. Well, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so thank you. much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Colin Peterson Fox, one of the biggies on the observation deck.